and get started now. Dr. Sharma, I will pull up your didactic for you and I'll just turn things over to you. Just let me know when you'd like me to advance to the next slide. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Mitra. Welcome everybody to this lecture. I know this is a busy part of uh, the year and I'm even surprised as many people have showed up, but uh, we'll do the best we can here. Uh, and from my perspective, this is a very important topic, but I think even from the perspective of non pulmonologists uh, this is a condition uh, which uh, you will be encountering on a frequent basis. So I think it would be good to know a little bit about the most recent uh, uh, thought process and the disease of pulmonary embolism. Next slide, please. So uh, I think the first question comes in is, why do we care about pulmonary embolism? And uh, uh, just to kind of give you some factual background to this condition is the most common preventable cause of death in hospitalized patients. So over 600,000 deaths per year <clears throat> and 10% uh, of all patients with acute PE will die within three months period of time. So pretty fatal condition, preventable, and that's what makes it um, uh, very important. And uh, I don't think that anybody who works in a hospitalized setting uh, would be uh, immune to uh, its presence or has not heard about it. So you'll encounter it very frequently. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide I wanted to share. Dr. Doyle had sent me an article, which is a very interesting article by the French uh, authors over here who had done a large study of over 800 patients, screening them for pulmonary embolism for patients who were admitted to the hospital for COPD exacerbation. Now, uh, I don't know in Europe, but uh, in the United States, uh, COPD exacerbation is one of the common conditions for hospital readmission, uh, you know, uh, probably among the top four after heart failure and pneumonia. So it's kind of a very relevant to our audience over here. And they found that uh, about 6% of prevalence of pulmonary embolism within 48 hours of admission of COPD. So a lot of time our treatment and approach to COPD exacerbation is very knee jerk approach and uh, give them steroids, give them antibiotics, give them inhalers and then uh, wait and watch. Uh, but the fact that 6% um, of them could be having shortness of breath from a fatal condition like PE, which is not recognized, is uh, pretty disconcerting. And, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, obvious that when you have that larger population with PE and COPD, that would translate into a higher mortality in these patients, which was observed as about 6.8% in three months period of time. And um, the good news is if you look at the highlighted red area, 10% of those were suspected PE, which means that a screening tool, which was used by these uh, folks called the Geneva score, had picked up some signs that they may have underlying PE, and only 3% was uh, prevalent among those um, who were not suspected of having PE. It's still consequential, but uh, the vast majority of these people can be screened. Uh, next slide, please. So why is it so difficult uh, to diagnose? Well, one of the things is very obvious as the slide shows that if you look at patients with PE confirmed and others who have been excluded, they pretty much come with the same kind of symptoms. Everybody has dyspnea, chest pain, cough, hemoptysis, syncope, very little to differentiate or give you a clue that this uh, shortness of breath is because of PE. Unfortunately, the signs uh, also don't help. Most patients who come with a similar presentation have tachycardia, tachypnea, signs of DVT fever and cyanosis. Next slide, please. Um, chest x-ray, what's the utility? Actually, this also is very non-specific. As far as a pulmonologist is concerned, however, it's a very useful test. One of the big uses uh, which we find in the world of pulmonary medicine is any presence 
of an obvious pathology in chest X-ray moves us away from pulmonary embolism. So it's not so much that is a positive predictive value, but for us, it has a lot of negative uh, value. <clears throat> if you have a chest X-ray done and you see a huge big consolidation, uh, then we tend to move away from PE. But as you see in this slide, a chest X-ray, which is clear with no obvious pathology and a patient showing significant shortness of breath, our index of suspicion uh, significantly goes up. Next slide, please. So uh, in summary, either the clinical signs, symptoms, even the uh, you know, initial testing uh, doesn't really exclude or confirm acute PE. And uh, hence, anybody who has come in to your attention with unexplained tachycardia or syncope should be considered for pulmonary embolism. Next slide, please. So here's the conundrum with PE. So all these slides, which I just showed to you, they instill a sense of fear in people taking care of pulmonary embolism, whether it's uh, emergency room physicians, pulmonologists, hospital hospitalists, is because they can't recognize it. There's no gold standard testing. So what has happened is overutilization of CT scan. So everybody who's got shortness of breath shows up in the emergency room. The knee-jerk reaction now has become to get a CAT scan, CT angiogram, so that they don't lose or uh, miss the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. And I think that has kind of gone too far. And this is what the pulmonary embolism conundrum is that on one end, it's very difficult to diagnose, remains underdiagnosed. And at the same time, we are over-testing everybody. And this topic in today's lecture is mostly how do we reconcile between the underdiagnosis and the overtesting. Next slide, please. So let's begin with, with a little case study, which will highlight to you how to approach these uh, two dichotomous, uh, uh, you know, endpoints in the treatment or management of P. So you're evaluating a 33-year-old an emergency room with shortness of breath, and again, a normal chest X-ray. The VEL score is 1.5. What do you think your next step would be? You want to do a PERC criteria. You're going to do a CT angiogram. You will proceed with a lower extremity Doppler or uh, do a serum D dimers. I don't know if there's a way to, for the participants to uh, vote on this. Absolutely. But, uh, um, I always encourage the chat feature. So um, okay. everyone who's on the call, just feel free to utilize the chat and um, I can monitor that for you, Dr. Sharma, and let you know some of the yeah, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, no marks deducted, no matter what answer you get, but I'm just curious to know how uh, folks are thinking. All right. We have an A. Someone we have A. a. Okay. Anyone else? I know there are at least 12 participants here, so <laughs> we can expect a few more. Mm -hmm. The shy group today. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> looks like uh, we have one answer for that. And um, I think it's Sa Santa. And Sana, you are absolutely correct. The uh, correct answer to this question is birth criteria. And we'll talk about that uh, in a second. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, this is a modified Wells criteria. Uh, I'll tell you more studies have been conducted on Wells criteria than any other validated score. So it's a very uh, nice score to use uh, something to keep in handy, especially if you're working um, as a hospitalist or as an emergency medicine. It's a set of uh, clinical questions and signs uh, with a certain score attached to it. And uh, if your score is higher than six, you have very high probability of pulmonary embolism. If you have a score of two to six, you have moderate uh, 
proportion for pulmonary embolism. And if you have low, which is less than, 10, less than two score, that is a low uh, possibility or probability of pulmonary embolism. However, a lot of people still are very disconcerted with the fact that 10% of PE can be still present in low uh, modified wells criteria. So what we discussed, what we have found out is that if we take this to the next step, which is please the next slide, called the PERC rule for pulmonary embolism, which is a bunch of uh, eight questions. And if answer to each one of them is no, then that 10% gets reduced to less than 2%. And that's uh, a very good starting point of uh, pulmonary embolism evaluation that if your well score is less than two, and your PERC score is all no, then the chances of PE are so remote that any further uh, investigation is not warranted. So this is a very handy tool. This is something which can save you millions of dollars in CAT scans and, and D-dimers and other investigation, including ultrasounds. And these patients can be easily discharged home. And uh, a lot of good studies have come in which have validated these uh, both markers. So go on next slide. So uh, the algorithm is very clear is that if you have low probability of the set of valves two, then you do a PERC rule out. And if your PERC is fulfilled, P is excluded, that patient has either some other etiology or patient can be discharged home. Now, if PERC, is not fulfilled, which means any of those answers is yes, then you proceed to D-dimers. And if your D-dimers more than 500, you proceed to CAT scan. So it is a very nice algorithmic approach, which works every time and saves hundreds of people from getting uh, CAT scans. If you remember from your uh, prior um, classes uh, that one CT scan is equivalent to 365 chest x-rays, which basically means you get in a chest x-ray on a daily basis. So there's a lot of radiation, a lot of uh, bad stuff has been documented and people get a lot of CAT scan and radiation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so D-dimers again is a very valuable test and it has a uh, more value in a negative predictor uh, sense than in a positive prediction. For example, if you have a negative D-dimer, you can safely say that there's a good 99% chance this patient does not have PE. However, if you have positive D-dimers, it does not mean the patient has PE. There are multiple reasons, including ongoing inflammation in the body, which can make the D-dimers uh, go high. So very good negative predictive value. Next slide, please. So here's another algorithm that if you determine patient is uh, having PE likely or unlikely, then if the patient you think has got an unlikely band of PE, then getting a D-dimer is like a confirmation of that pretest, low pretest probability. And having a D-dimer less than 500 almost uh, always excludes pulmonary embolism. So another way of saving uh, healthcare dollars and uh, unnecessary testing, which is so prevalent uh, in this um, area of medicine. Next slide, please. So as I again said, uh, if the D-dimer is elevated, then its specificity is low. It has very little value. If the D-dimer is positive, you have to go on further to continue investigating and ruling out uh, thromboembolic uh, phenomena. Next slide, please. So let's go to another question here. The same patient with intermediate probability or low probability now comes back with an elevated D-dime. And your next step would be a VQ scan, a CT angiogram, a left lower extremity ultrasound, or you know, require no further testing, you have to start and decoagulation. So I'll open it up to the forum. Please uh, 
put in your uh, answers. We got B. Okay, we got uh, one answer. Anybody else wanting to attempt? We got AB. Okay. AB, very good, very good. And I, I think that that exactly is uh, the uh, intent of this question, that unfortunately there, there's not one but multiple correct answers. It depends on the scenario. So the only uh, wrong answer in this is actually D, that just having a positive D dimer uh, as I said uh, uh, earlier, alluded to you, the negative D dimer has an excellent negative predictive value, and you can rule out PE, but a positive D dimer doesn't confirm PE. So you can't start anticoagulation just on the basis of D dimers. You have to dig further. Now, comes in what test is best it is very open to interpretation. Yes, by and large. Uh, CT angiography is so widely available these days that most would go for CT angiography. So for purely board questions, I think B is would, uh, would go ahead and be the right answer. But uh, remember, there are many scenarios where CT angiogram may not be available. Number two, the patient may have an allergic reaction to some dyes and may not be able to, to get so much of dye. Patient may have kidney failure renal failure and may not be able to tolerate that high amount of dye given for CTA. So for that reason, a VQ scan is a good alternative uh, for those uh, patients who can't undergo CTA. Uh, a lot of people also feel that a lower extremity ultrasound uh, may not be a next good screening test, specifically in patients who cannot undergo either uh, radiation, uh, for example, pregnant ladies, and who can get a left uh, lower extremity ultrasound, and the presence of a DVT uh, would confirm need for anticoagulation, whether it's PE additional to DVT or, or none. Uh, of course, there are instances where you could have PE in the absence of DVT, uh, and, and those are cases which you still would have to continue to work up, but let's say uh, a pregnant woman who's short of breath, tachypneic, tachycardic came in and you did a low extremity ultrasound and found a DVT. Actually, no further testing is required. So, so a lot of people have a lot of ways of thinking about this. And the, the bottom line is, depending on the circumstances, any of these could be the correct answer, except it. Next slide, please. All right, so a 70-year-old nursing home patient with history of COPD brought into emergency room for increased dyspnea for 48 hours, has bilateral wheezing, no calf pain and tenderness, no hemoptysis. Given nebulizers and prelim test ordered, heart rate was 102. Uh, you have been consulted uh, for an elevated D-dimer, which was uh, also part of the battery of tests sent in the ED and came out to be 650, which uh, uh, is elevated more than 500, as we saw the other uh, algorithm. So at that point, uh, what would you recommend the ED physician to do? Get a CT angiogram, get a lower extremity ultrasound, get a VQ scan, or no further testing is required. So I'll take another word at this time for, uh, to help you understand have one response in saying D as in dog, another okay. D. Okay. So I'm, looks like I'm preaching to the choir. This is a very well-educated uh, group and uh, the correct answer indeed is D. So uh, <clears throat> I'll show you why it's D because I think uh, first of all, you need to know the scenario. Remember uh, everything in PE is whether the patient has any alternative diagnosis which can explain the condition. Uh, this, this question clearly tells you the patient has COPD. He clearly says he's got bilateral wheezing. There's no cough pain, no tenderness, no hemoptysis. So this is looking like a very much like a COPD exaggeration. But in uh, consideration to the first slide, which we uh, 
went through that there could be hidden pulmonary embolism, a D-dimer was indeed done. It was 650. Next slide, please. So some of uh, the audience may wonder why is that not then a positive test? Well, 500 is indeed the cutoff and you're right about that. But beyond 500, age becomes a very important determinant on the number. So older the people are, the higher that normal D-dimer range becomes. For example, if you multiply the age by 10, that is the normal limit for the D-dimer for that person. So 60 year old multiplied by 10, that's 600. So all the normal is 500, but for that 60 year old, it becomes 600. Our patient was 70 years old. So multiply that by 10, and that 700 is the normal value of D-dimers for this person. So D-dimers uh, increases with age, and uh, you have to age, age adjust to uh, interpret the results. In this case, it was 650, but our patient's age was 70 years old, so his normal was up to 700. And considering the other scenarios, we didn't think anything else was required. Next step, please. So uh, switching gears, uh, this was about how you're gonna deal in the emergency room, first interaction with the patient whom you suspect with the PE, how can you safely rule out PE, send a patient home, use these validated questionnaires to arrive at, at a scientific conclusion? Now switching gears about the worst come scenario. So what are the poor prognostic signs? The patient with PE has low blood pressure. Uh, that definitely increases your mortality. Uh, <clears throat> syncope is a bad sign. Shock is a really, really bad sign and cardiac arrest is very, very bad. So all of these uh, situations accompanied with PE uh, tremendously impact uh, the mortality or outcome negatively. Next, next slide, please. The other are always uh, uh, trust the biomarkers. So when you do have a patient who's been diagnosed with uh, PE, these biomarkers can tell you or prognosticate these patients. So one of the important prognosticating biomarkers is troponins. So remember troponins is just not positive in MI, it can be positive in pulmonary embolism. And um, normal troponin has a very high negative predictive value, which means the patient is gonna do very well with troponin are not elevated. But if a patient with PE is admitted with troponin being elevated and which continues to go up, that's a sign of bad outcome. Next slide, please. Similar to uh, the troponins, BNP, a brain natriuretic peptide, also is a very good marker for outcome in patients with uh, pulmonary embolism. So these biomarkers uh, are, uh, have to be immediately drawn and its value is not just in the preliminary uh, uh, you know, numbers of these biomarkers, but is also value in serially monitoring them to see whether the patient is getting worse or better. Next slide, please. Now, the most important thing is they are right ventricular dysfunction. Remember, you have had an event in your pulmonary vasculature. To your pulmonary vasculature is connected your RV. The RV has very thin walls it is not capable of taking any stress. So anytime there's increased pressure, it dilates very quickly. And we can utilize that information to gain more insight into pulmonary embolism and its outcome uh, in, uh, down the road. So for example, RV dilatation is a bad sign, a poor prognostic sign. What we also use is called the ratio, called the RV to LV ratio. And if you look at the cartoon image on uh, the slide, you're gonna see a line dropped at the base of the RV, which is the top part. So RV is closest to your chest wall. So the, the top part close to the sternum is your right, atria, right ventricular uh, chamber. On the bottom is your left ventricle. So the line A represents the base of right ventricle while line B 
uh, indicates the base of left ventricle. Ideally, it should be opposite. The B line should be as long as A, and the B and the A should be equal to B. But it's reversed in this condition. So the base of your RV is much wider compared to the base of the LV. And that is a very poor prognostic sign. Uh, in the study done in 2005 by Muir, they showed that 1.5 or more increase in RV to LV ratio is uh, directly associated with uh, increased death on three months right? Next slide, please. Here's another example of what I was alluding is that uh, you could utilize your CAT scan or CT angiogram itself to determine the RV to LV ratio. Sometimes you don't have to wait for an echocardiogram or bedside ultrasound because CT scan, especially the one with angiogram uh, and a dye can give you a very good idea about the ratio between the base of RV and LV. In this case, again, RV ratio is not only elevated, but in a few hours it actually gets worse from 1.65 to 1.74, which suggests worsening uh, pulmonary embolism and hemodynamic collapse. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a uh, very similar, but showing the septum deviation towards the left side. And obviously when your RV gets stretched beyond a certain limit, your septum, which separates the RV to LV, starts shifting and bulging towards the left side. And that's another bad sign that uh, right ventricular collapse is imminent. Next slide, please. So risk stratification and management, we're gonna talk some about what happens when you get into a mass, submassive or massive PE. Next slide, please. So we talked about the low risk pulmonary embolism. We spent a lot of time how we can find out who is at a lower risk for pulmonary embolism and can be safely discharged home. Now let's go into the world of uh, massive PE, submassive PE. Massive PE is defined any time when your blood pressure of systolic is less than 90 over 15 minutes despite fluid bolus. In essence, if you see the person for the first time whom you suspect of having pulmonary embolism, patient has low blood pressure and you give a liter of fluid and you watch him over 15 minutes and the blood pressure still remains less than 90, that is defined as massive pulmonary embolism. Submassive PE, on the other hand, is borderline blood pressure. We talked about the RV to LV ratio, that being elevated. Biomarkers like BNP and troponin being elevated. Significant hypoxemia requiring external oxygenation support. Or patient complaining of syncope or presyncope. These would come under the domain of submassive PE. Um, the submassive PE by default has to be admitted to ICU. That's one lesson uh, you need to know about uh, this categorization. While massive PE has to be approached wherever you see that patient, whether it's in the emergency room or in, on the floor, these patients needs to be given systemic thrombolytics uh, immediately. Next slide, please. So take home message as I alluded, all of these massives of massive P have a very high um, chance of uh, dying or having a bad outcome. So these should be mandatorily admitted to ICU for close observation. Next slide, please. So let's say we're in this domain of submassive pulmonary embolism and uh, Let's learn more about it through this case. A 56-year-old male is admitted to ICU for pulmonary embolism and receives low molecular weight heparin. And while he was on the treatment, suddenly becomes hypertensive with blood pressure of 78 over 54, despite a liter of fluid bolus. 
and his oxygen saturation is on 93% on four liters of oxygen. Lungs are clear. What do you think is the most appropriate next step you want to do at this time? You want to immediately start uh, thrombolytics, which is A, TPA, or change the patient to apexibin. Uh, number C, change to IV heparin, or continue low molecular heparin and consult IR for catheter-directed thrombolysis. So I, I think this is a good teaching slide because I see variation in uh, answers provided uh, by our audience. And I think this is a typical confusion. It is uh, uh, seen across the board, um, very natural because this is a very gray zone. And uh, to begin with, the right answer in this question is A, uh, thrombolysis. So remember, we talked about massive uh, PE, and we said that the gold standard approach and treatment for massive PE is basically thrombolysis. And how you define massive PE is if you've given a liter of fluid and you're still unable to move the blood pressure above 90 of systolic, and that's massive PE. The reason is the massive PE at that junction is very close to having a cardiac arrest. There is really no time. So if you look at alternative apaxaban or heparin, they take hours, uh, sometimes even days to work. So that obviously is not going to be an option. Now, D is one of the areas of confusion. And uh, I'll tell you that why this is not a universal answer. There are two big reasons. One big reason is that catheter-directed thrombolysis, as enticing as it seems, is not available in all institutions. The only tertiary care hospitals where this uh, uh, you know, modality or procedure is even available. The vast majority of pulmonary embolisms happen in smaller institutions. They are not coming directly to, ter to uh, tertiary care hospitals. So they do not have these modalities. Number two, if somebody is crashing and is in imminent cardiac arrest in front of you, the time taken from door to get uh, to catheter uh, is much higher. You have to call IR. That IR person may be at home. And by the time they come over here, set up the, uh, the lab for catheter-directed thrombolysis, the patient could be dead. Okay, That's another reason. But the third and the most important reason is there is no data. So all the data, and I'm going to talk about that, the data, because to some it may come as a surprise that what are you talking about? I've seen catheter-directed thrombolysis all over, and you're telling me there's no data. And I'll show you some data from my perspective as to why pulmonologists are hesitant to go that route uh, in general. So next slide, please. So coming back to some very big trials in the domain of submassive PE. Uh, this was the largest trial of over 1,000 patients called the PETO trial. And uh, it was performed in 2012. And uh, the idea was that if we find somebody with massive PE, which means your biomarkers are elevated or your LV, RV to LV ratio is elevated, then obviously this is not a bread and butter pulmonary embolism case. And we need to look into whether these patients may uh, benefit from thrombolytics uh, prematurely or early on into the game rather than when the patient is collapsing. So it's a randomized control trial, placebo versus uh, tenecteplase uh, in, in these patients. And the primary endpoint was death or hemodynamic collapse within sec seven days. Secondary endpoint uh, was uh, basically um, side effects within 38 uh, days um, or death or hemodynamic collapse in seven days. Next slide, please. So here's the results, which I have uh, highlighted uh, just for uh, getting everybody's attention here. So it was a positive study. The primary outcome was positive. People who got thrombolytics, which is the tenecteplase, that arm 
had uh, a significant improvement or better outcome as compared to placebo. Um, now, one thing you may note that the primary endpoint was just defined as death or hemodynamic decompensation. So right below we have marked, just pay attention to death and hemodynamics. Majority of this positive primary outcome was driven by hemodynamic decompensation and not by death as noted in the p-value section on the last day. So you're gonna say, well, that's great. That's exactly my point was that these people should be getting thrombolytics early on, but wait till the next slide. All right. So the problem with this trial was, although it was a positive trial, there was significant increased major extracranial bleed defined as head bleed or hem ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke. And um, uh, I think this was obviously a big setback since there's not much you can do with the head bleed. Uh, and I think that because of this, the, the whole uh, enthusiasm for thrombolytics uh, was dampened uh, because who wants a head bleed in return of a PE? So uh, this was the PETO trial. Uh, next slide, please. So based on this, people started thinking, well, if it is showing improvement, you're showing better improvement in hemodynamic collapse and primary output, maybe, maybe it's the dose which needs to be adjusted to prevent head bleed. So that gave rise, rise to what we call as the MOPET trial. So instead of using 100 milligram of thrombolytics and this only half the dose of 50 milligrams of thrombolytics were used, 121 patients were involved in the study. And it showed that even with half the dose, there was reduced pulmonary artery systolic pressure, which is a surrogate marker of uh, decompression of the RV. However, there was no impact on mortality but the, the point of this trial was that none of the patients got any head bleed or any major bleed, uh, which could be uh, labeled as a serious adverse event. Next slide. So th these two trials started giving an idea to people that, hey, instead of giving systemic thrombolytics, why don't we go straight to the pulmonary artery and give much lower doses of uh, thrombolytics right where the problem is? So the concept obviously was, uh, you know, very, um, uh, you know, enticing because it gave us another venue for treating this fatal disease. So let's go on to the next slide. So the first trial uh, that was conducted was a uh, you know, randomized uh, controlled trial, which looked at direct thrombolytics uh, in these patients. And they looked at um, 59 patients with submassive PE. And remember that the first study, the PITO gave 100 milligrams of TPA. The second, the MOPED study gave only half, which was 50, didn't have any bleed. And in the catheter directed, they were going down to as low as 10 to 20 milligrams of TPA, although it was a 15 hour uh, continuous infusion. And their primary endpoint was RV over LV ratio um, uh, and um, any bleeding complication. Next slide, please. So uh, the, uh, and I've not shown you the results, if you can go back to the prior study before coming to the Seattle too. Thank you, Mitra. So, so this trial basically showed that there was improvement in RV to uh, LV ratio. There was no head bleed, but the mortality at the end of 28 day period or seven day period, both of them were not any different. So the message learned, or at least uh, how it was interpreted was, uh, okay, it's good, good in the sense it doesn't make people bleed, but if there is no difference in mortality, then how do we justify a procedure which is fairly invasive, put in a catheter, go into the heart or the pulmonary vessels, and then uh, you know injecting thrombolytics? Uh, 
And uh, even though there were no major bleeds, there were local bleeds like, uh, you know, a retroperitoneal bleed and there was some femoral bleeding. And if there was no mortality difference, then we thought that RV to ratio to LV ratio was a soft endpoint. Next point, next slide, please. So same way a Seattle 2 study was conducted. This was again a prospective single arm multicentric study in this uh, an ultrasound facilitated catheter was used in which not only a thrombolytics are given, but there's an ultrasonic um, wave sent out to disperse these clots uh, from that region. And uh, unfortunately they did the same thing. They looked at the RV uh, to LV ratio and hemodynamics in seven days. And they found uh, that although the RV to LV ratio improved, there was no difference in the hemodynamics at seventh day and no difference in mortality on 28th day. Next slide, please. So um, again, this, uh, this is the Seattle 2 ECOS study. Uh, not randomized, low dose TPA, and again, looking at RV to LV ratio in 48 hours. So um, one of the, 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 the problems with these studies is that uh, these are software, uh, you know, endpoints to use. And sometimes when you use surrogate endpoints, as you probably have um, all of you witness uh, sometimes or the other, is that doesn't truly mean that, that the patient would have mortality benefit. So just because I'm loading down a certain number or a biomarker doesn't mean that that's gonna have a salutary impact on the outcome also. Next slide, please. So this was a meta-analysis which was performed of all of the PE studies. And what they basically came to the conclusion was that yes, there is a trend towards better survival. And these include all, uh, both systemic as well as uh, uh, catheter-based studies, but there's significant major bleed, uh, which these uh, thrombolytics can induce in these patients with pulmonary embolism. Next slide, please. This is a much recent study done where they've looked at, let's say if we don't use any thrombolytics and we just go into the pulmonary vessels and then evacuate mechanically that thrombus and take it out. Uh, again, this is a prospective single arm, not a randomized controlled trial. And unfortunately, they also fell in for the same uh, endpoint, which is very enticing, but not necessarily convincing. As you can see, both LV to L ratio, L RV to LV ratio was reduced in patients who had intervention and in patients who had slightly elevated pulmonary artery pressures, that also improved to some extent. Uh, but again, the FLARE study was un, uh, unable to show any mortality benefit at the end of the day. So another procedure, another intervention, but no robust endpoints to show. Next slide, please. So based on all of this data that we have so far, now this is a very dynamic field and things can change next year if a large randomized control trial comes and shows us one thing or the other. But based on that, the American College of uh, Chest Physicians 2016 recommendations on thrombolytics were that in most patients with acute pulmonary embolism, not associated with hypertension, Systemically administered thrombolytic therapy is recommended against. So they felt that it is not ready for prime time, uh, especially in patients with submassive PE. Again, as I said, this is not a recommendation for massive PE. In massive PE, the recommendation is to give immediately um, uh, systemic thrombolytics. They also said that in select patients with acute PE who deteriorate after starting anticoagulation therapy, but have yet to develop hypertension, who have low risk, low bleeding risk, systemically administered thrombolytic therapies preferred over no such therapy. So they are 
leaning towards systemic administration of thrombolytics because there's mortality benefit in that. But they are not alluding to catheter-based because there's, there's no mortality benefit that has been shown so far. So this is 2016 recommendations. Next slide, please. Uh, we already talked about the embolectomy and surgery embolectomy. This is the recommendation by the ACCP is that, P, that uh, patients with massive PE who cannot receive fib fibrinolytics and who remain unstable even after thrombolytics consider transfer to institution experience to either catheter embolectomy or surgical embolectomy. So this is a class 2A recommendation, which means that your systemic thrombolytics have failed. And only then, and only then, and if you have that uh, facility available close by in your institution, then you consider either a catheter or a surgical embolectomy. Next slide, please. So what's the latest? So this uh, ACCP guidelines were, uh, were um, updated recently in 2021. So they considered all the data which is available since 2016 till now, which is obviously five years. And the question they asked was, uh, should mechanical or pharmacomechanical intervention, pharmacomechanical means we can have a combination of thrombolytics as well as uh, mechanical intervention versus anticoagulation therapy alone be given to patients with acute pulmonary embolism. Correct? So that's the big uh, elephant in the room. So the answer to that was in patients with acute PE who are treated with thrombolytic agents, we suggest systemic thrombolytic therapy using a peripheral vein over catheter directed thrombolysis. Okay. Again, it's a weak recommendation, and again, it's based on this large data or body of so far available that catheter-directed thrombolysis has not been shown to have any mortality benefit. And if you use systemic thrombolytics and maybe half the dose uh, and, and in an appropriate time when the patient is either collapsing or about to collapse, there is more benefit than harm. Number two, in patients with acute PE associated with hypotension who, are, who also have a high bleeding risk, have failed systemic thrombolysis, or shock that is likely to cause death before systemic thrombolysis can be taken effect, which uh, to me really doesn't make sense because if somebody's in shock in front of you, systemic thrombolysis are maybe two minutes away as compared to catheter directed, which could be hours away. So the, I'm, I'm not so sure what they meant by number three, but here it is. If appropriate expertise and resources are available, we suggest catheter-assisted thrombosis removal over no such intervention. Again, it's a weak recommendation and low certainty evidence. So that's in nutshell is the prevalent thought process across the pulmonary world that catheter-based uh, either shouldn't be used, or if used, it should be only used if we have failed to use the uh, systemic thrombolytics, which have, have much more robust data in terms of outcome as compared to catheter. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I think, again, I want you to first focus on this pendulum, because it's a very, very important take-home message is that low pulmonary, low risk pulmonary embolism is causing as much heartburn as high risk pulmonary embolism. The reason being there's just so many unnecessary CT scans being done on a daily basis on these patients. So utilize these screening tools, the wells and the PERC, and they are very, very well validated and an algorithmic uh, approach to these patients would definitely benefit both you and the patient. And number two, that all massive and submassive pulmonary embolism patients should be admitted to ICU, as I alluded earlier. These people can very rapidly deteriorate and have a bad outcome. Thrombolytics are still controversial, and you should be guided by the hemodynamics and respiratory compromise. If you do go down that road, 
then remember that systemic thrombolytics are, are the number one choice and you're protected by the guidelines by ACCP, which bless um, that approach. And then if the, all of that fails, you may consider surgical or catheter-based thrombolytics. Thank you very much. Hope this was a, a learning experience and I'll open to taking any questions. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Sharma. It's always wonderful having you here and presenting. Um, I see Dr. Doyle actually was able to hop on here. So that's awesome. But looks like he's on a phone call right now. But did anyone have any questions, comments, thoughts that you wanted to share with the group? Um, feel free to unmute. And uh, if you want to chat in, I'm happy to read the chat as well. We've got uh, Lisa thanking you in the chat. Uh, and Sana, I see you uh, raised your hand. Would you like to unmute and ask your question or comment? Yes, I had a question. Um, so have you have any, have you had, has Dr. Sharma had any experiences with uh, PE being misdiagnosed as um, uh, like a coronary artery or cardiac arrest? Um, and uh, how has that played like um, is is are we able to save the patient's life in that case um, it's a good question right somebody comes with massive chest pain crushing chest pain it's hard sometimes uh, your differential diagnosis remains aortic dissection massive uh, MI or a massive PE for that matter of fact so sometimes when these patients are in cardiac arrest and you're doing the best, these patients do get thrombolytics. Uh, and I think those are useful in either case until you have sorted uh, the, the differential diagnosis. Uh, but um, if the patient is coming in in a, um, in a submassive PE uh, where there's no acute emergency patients, not any cardiac uh, arrest, uh, then Troponins generally tend to be very high in acute MI. Troponins are elevated in PE, but never to the, to the level of thousands. So if you have massive uh, MI, you're gonna talk about troponin levels of 20,000, 30,000, and you would have EKG changes, uh, which would be um, very consistent with acute MI. But in pulmonary embolism, you would have troponins maybe in hundreds, sometimes in low thousand, but not in 20,000 or 30,000 range. So that's an important marker uh, of, of uh, differentiation. EKG, obviously, you will never see a SD segment elevation, uh, you know, in PE. You may see some uh, T wave inversions and you may see R wave increase in size because of RV stress, uh, but not the typical findings of acute MI. So in, in general, if it is submassive, uh, you know, although there may be confusion in the beginning, as time progresses, we're generally able to make out uh, one with the other. They are also not that acutely sick, so these people can undergo CTA very quickly. They can also get bedside ultrasound. So bedside ultrasound is very ubiquitous these days. Uh, we do that all the time. And uh, in within a few seconds, we can see if the RV is so massively dilated that is inconsistent with an acute MI. And this is much more consistent with the picture of uh, uh, acute uh, PE. So yes, uh, if it is a massive pulmonary embolism, sometimes very hard because these people are in cardiac arrest, but in that case, I think you're treated, treating everything, including with thrombolytics, which would hopefully be beneficial in either case until the patient is stabilized. On the other hand, submassive, there's enough time uh, for you to make a determination one with the other. Hope that helps. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. And uh, thank you, Santa, for the question. Um, Dr. Doyle, I see you hopped on here. Can you hear us okay? I think you are still on mute. <laughs> Did anyone else have any questions or comments for the group? I think it might be worth commenting real quick with, you know, COVID. We see so many patients who, you know, renal failure, 
too unstable to go to a scanner and just get empirically treated with at least, you know, a heparin drip for presumed PE, even if they have, you know, diffuse bilateral infiltrates. Um, we know we get transfers like that all the time. Is there data for that practice or um, should people be considering that? I think a lot of times people don't know what else to do and folks are so hypoxic, they just throw the whole kitchen sink. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, COVID has uh, thrown a real monkey wrench into uh, this whole uh, you know, business of uh, pulmonary embolism because it's a very hypercoagulable state in the first place. So I think uh, thinking in those terms and thinking about clotting is, is very appropriate and uh, intervening early on, uh, you know, is also very important in that case. So we have often done that uh, technique of early empiric starting heparin therapy with the hope of buying time. So we, we don't empirically diagnose these people and then keep them on heparin forever, but we buy time. And if the patient is too sick, then we do at least a lower extremity ultrasound and a bedside ultrasound and an echo. And that can at least tell us if there's any major massive or submassive PE. If there's a very small subsegmental PE, uh, that's a different story. But majority of the time, we are able to capture either with low extremity Doppler or looking at the RV dilatation uh, and LV to RV to LV ratio, we can determine if this patient had a PE. Many of these clots don't dissolve until several weeks down the road. So once the patient is stable, we do send the patient to either appropriately VQ scan or a CAT scan when they're stable in order to determine how long these patients may need a therapy or these can be safely taken off uh, those uh, anticoagulation. Thank you so much, Dr. Stansbury, for that comment. And thank you, Dr. Sharma. Dr. Doyle, I see you have unmuted there. Glad you could hop on here. Good to see you. Yeah, you probably can't hear me, but sorry I missed the, the burden. I told Mitra that we were interviewing a candidate for the director of the Appalachian Pulmonary Health Project. So. Uh, very relevant to what we're to the, to the general work here. Really sad presentation, Dr. Sharma, but I'm going to watch it. Yeah, you're welcome, and uh, and I uh, thank you for sharing that uh, article from JEMA. I was able to uh, uh, knit it very nicely into the, the presentation. Thank you very much. Great. And uh, in the recap email, I will be attaching the YouTube video to rewatch this session. Um, along with Dr. Sharma's PowerPoint. So um, everyone will have a copy of that. Uh, Sam Giordano chatted and saying, I wish you all happy and healthy holidays. Thank you so much. Um, but with that, I guess I'll go into the announcements. Um, so our next session will be on January 3rd and Dr. Stansbury actually will be discussing primary care management of sleep apnea. So keep an eye out for that reminder. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma for an awesome didactic um, was finishing off the year strong, I will say that, so thank you. Um, and I wish you all a really safe, wonderful holiday. I really appreciate each and every one of you, and I look forward to the new year. So thank you all so much. Take care. Happy holidays for everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye.